Okay, so this talk is about sound effects. So given that it's about sound effects, I think it would be prudent to discuss what exactly sound effects are. I mean, sound effects are representations of sounds, but what does that mean? How do you represent sound? So if I hit this podium, or if I were to like punch somebody or something, how would you, how would you convey the sound that that action produced without replicating the sound itself? How would you convey it in a sort of written medium as comics do? Well, it turns out that there's two ways in which you can do this. The first representation is an iconic representation, which really just means on monarchia. So that's what you know as prototypical sound effects, that kind of stuff. So bang, cow. These are basically these words are basically mimetic representations of noises. And they're iconic because well they're called iconic because the words themselves were designed and they are written to mimic or approximate the sounds that they are trying to convey. So for example, the word bang, like the sound that the word bang describes, sounds pretty close to the actual word bang. And the same goes for all of these onomatopoeia. So on the other hand, the other type of representation that we can use to write down sounds is symbolic. And that's really just a descriptive approach. So basically, these sound effects they don't mimic the sounds that they attempt to uh, describe. They literally just describe them. So words like loud or quiet or harsh or pleasing. These words are not inherently loud, quiet, harsh, or pleasing. They're just des descriptions of that quality itself. And because of that, um, they're called symbolic because the representation between the word and the thing that it describes is arbitrary and basically symbolic in nature. And the last kind of symbolic way to describe the sound that an action produces is literally just write the sound itself. So you could just say punch. But and as bizarre as all this might seem, like you'd be like, why? What? I've never seen the sound effects like this. Like who puts punch when somebody gets punched? Like it's obviously foul. Despite the fact that some of you may not be familiar with these specific types of sound effects, they do occur in comics, as we will see in a few minutes. So, now that we've talked about the semantic properties of sound effects, let's talk a little bit about the structure. So, interestingly enough, the structure of sound effects is similar to that of regular speech bubbles. So, as you can see in the diagram we have here, um, regular speech bubbles are produced by a root, and they're connected to the root by a tail, which you can also see pointed out right there. The carrier refers to the shape of the bubble itself, and then the content obviously is what's inside the bubble. So the structure of sound effects is pretty similar. You still have your root, you still have your carrier, and you have content inside the carrier. The only difference is that there may or may not be a tail. Well, to be precise, there may or may not be a depicted tail, but there usually is a tail because you understand or at least can make a guess as to what root is producing the sound effect when you see a sound effect. The relationship between the root and the carrier and the content is still present, so whether or not there's an explicitly drawn tail, you still, to some extent, understand that there is a relationship between the two. So now we come to the question of this study, which really is, are there differences in the ways American genres of comics treat sound effects? And how about genres of Japanese manga? And what about between these cultures? So, that's what we're going to be looking at. But first, let's talk about what the specific genres that we chose to look at are. So for American comics, we have mainstream, which is one of the two genres that we selected. And an example of a mainstream comic is, as you can see, The Avengers. And here we have a full list, hopefully you can read that, um, a full list of the mainstream works we coded uh, along with the year of publication. And then to, uh, pr to present a sort of contrasting viewpoint, we also examined independent comics. And independent comics we are basically defined as long-form, non-superhero American comics. So that's a kind of a little bit of a hodgepodge of a category, but we were really looking to try and contrast the mores and traditions of this mainstream 
genre with basically anything else. So the independent category is a little bit of a mix of a grab bag, I guess. And if you want to look at the specific list of works that we have, it's right there. Okay. Now for our Jap Japanese comics, we picked a, pr a different, an entirely different uh, split of genres. The first genre of Japanese works that we looked at is shonen, which literally means boys in Japanese. So these shonen works are works that are targeted to young adolescent boys. An example is this work right here, Bleach, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. It was on the Cartoon Network and stuff, probably still is. Um, here's the full list of the shonen works that we analyzed, uh, along with the chapter number and the year of publication. And to contrast with shonen, we have shoujo, which is girls. Again, literally meaning girls. And these comics, rather self-explanatorily, are targeted towards girls, mostly younger girls. So I'd say uh, below the age of 18. And here is the full list of shoujo comics if you're interested in that. Okay. So what are the, some of the specific features that we analyzed in those comics that I just listed off for you? Like what specific things did we look for and code for? So the first thing is what we call lexical category. So what that really means is the type of sound effect. When we coded for any specific sound effect, we examined what type of sound effect is this specific sound effect. For the American works, we looked at two lexical categories. The first one is onomatopoeia, and the second one is descriptive. And I've talked about these before. This is pretty much the exact same stuff that I mentioned in the iconic and symbolic portion at the beginning of the talk. So onomatopoeic sound effects, sorry, I didn't get the script up. Um, onomatopoeic sound effects are iconic representations of sounds. So here we have creesh, which is like the sound of glass breaking. And then on the other side, for descriptive, we have somebody getting punched, and then literally the word punch be written on the page and somebody in a headlock, and then the word headlock on the page. So as you can see, this is, it's basically, again, a contrast. One is an iconic representation, the other is a symbolic representation. And we, when coding for sound effects in American comics, we try to put the sound effect, we examine whether the sound effects fell into the former or the latter category. And, I mean, we're using the term sound effect here, but as you can probably tell, the descriptive sound effects are not really sounds, they're just words. Punch is not a sound. But, in these comics, it's being used in the way that sounds are being used. So it falls under the umbrella of sound effects. Okay. For Japanese lexical categories, we kind of took a little bit of a different approach. Um, the terms used here are actually Japanese terms. The first one is Gyogo, which is basically correspondent with the concept of onomatopoeia in English. It's iconic representations of noises. So if you see, if you look at the little anno annotation at the bottom there, the Gyogo, which I pointed to with the red arrow, it's, it says za, but what that means in Japanese is rustle. So it's like the sound of the grass rustling in this particular manga panel. This is contrasted with Hikaigo, which is not like descriptive. So descriptive, Sound effects, as we talked about earlier, are symbolic representations of sounds. Gitaigo is actually an iconic representation, but not of sounds, of states, emotions, or actions, so things that don't produce sound. And English does not have an equivalent for this. But as you can see on the panel that I've included over here, we have the Gitaigo uh, when she's hugging the guy and it's squeezed tightly. So that doesn't really make a sound. It's just an iconic representation of a state or an action. So when I coded the Japanese works, we tried to examine whether or not the um, each, each instance of a sound effect was onomatopoeic or gitaigo, which we, I don't know, there's no really way to say it in English, but I guess you can kind of think of it as descriptive in that it's separate from onomatopoeic. Okay, that might have been a little bit difficult to understand, so let's have an example. This is Pikachu, as I hope you all know. Um, <laughs> Pikachu's name is actually a combination of one Gitaigo and one 
Hyongo word. So the pika part comes from the Japanese word pika pika, which is a gitaigo for the word, for the state of sparkling. So it literally means sparkly. And again, when things sparkle, they don't really make any noise. But in Japanese, they use a sound effect to communicate this idea. The chu part means squeak, and it's basically the sound that a mouse makes. The onomatopoeia for mice in Japanese. It's kind of like how meow is for cats in English. So when you have sparkle plus squeak, you get Pikachu, which is a pretty apt name for an electrically charged rodent. <laughs> okay, so what did we find out um, about the proportions of lexical categories in each culture and genre? As far as American, is con American uh, genres are concerned, there, we've had the rather startling revelation that there are zero, literally zero, instances of descriptive onomatopoeia in mainstream works. And this kind of aligns with your general representation or your general idea of comics because most people haven't seen that kind of stuff in your everyday uh, superhero comic. There are instances in other uh, researchers' work where they found very rare um, occurrences of descriptive onomatopoeia in superhero works, but suffice to say that it's incredibly rare. And um, so what, me, on the other hand, sound effects in independent works, while still primarily or predominantly um, onomatopoeic, a good chunk of them, around 20% actually, are descriptive. On the side of uh, Japanese uh, genres, we see that first the discrepancy is a little less drastic. Each genre in the Japanese culture features both kinds of sound effects, but shonen or boys uh, manga is dominated by onomatopoeic sound effects, so hiongo. And then girls' manga is dominated by gitaigo, which is the states, emotions, actions, indicators. So, what does this mean? Well, first, it tells us that each genre in each culture differs in the sound effects that it prefers, or well, in the lexical categories that it prefers when communicating sound effects. And these preferences are related to the characteristics of the genre itself. Mainstream superhero comics are all about creating believable, authentic depictions of a fictional universe. So they use traditional sound effects that tries to mimic sound. They're trying to approximate as close as they can the actual experience of being in the room or whatever when Batman is beating somebody up. Independent comics are about experimentation. They're about departure from traditional mainstream conventions. They stand opposed to mainstream superhero comics. So these works tend to experiment in the same way with their use of sound effects. They play with the semantic idea of the sound effect itself by using things that are not iconic, but symbolic. Shonen manga, which is the boy's Japanese manga, is about battles. It's about people yelling and screaming with Dragon Ball Z and big hairdos and stuff like that. And therefore, it stands, I mean, it makes sense that the sound effects in shonen manga are noisy, clamorous affairs, like what Gyongo and Anamonopia is supposed to be. If you think of classic Anamonopia in English, it's like noisy stuff, like bang, pow, boom. That's the kind of stuff that dominates shonen manga, and that's for a reason. Similarly, shoujo, well, not similarly, actually, contrarily, um, shoujo comics are about relationships between characters, they're about love, about emotions, and about everyday events. So instead of having bangs, pows, and booms, which you don't tend to encounter on your way to and from school and whatnot, you, they tend to prefer sound effects that communicate emotions, states, and actions, which is what Daigo, which is, which is what the Kitaigo that predominates shoujo is about. Okay, the next feature that we looked at for our uh, Japanese, for our coding of sound effects is script choice. And this only happened 
And this is only a feature that exists in Japanese comics because it's part of the Japanese language itself. So Japanese has four written scripts, but only two of them are used in sound effects. The first one is hiragana, and the second one is katakana. So as you can see, both of these words say the same thing, but obviously the letters that are being used look different. And there are a lot of differences between hiragana and katakana, but for our purposes, we can boil it down to the fact that hiragana is an everyday script. It was developed by women and is considered to be gentle and sort of mellifluous with its rounded shapes. Katakana is called an alphabet of action by many Japanese scholars, was once used to write military detective directives, for example, and is now primarily used for loan books. And as you can see, it's sharp and angular. So what did we find with script choice? Well, we see that, again, each genre tends to prefer a specific type of script when writing sound effects. Shonen manga prefers katakana, and shoujo manga prefers hiragana. So.